Hey, Ramon. Hey, Ramon. How are you? It's so nice to meet you. I know, virtually. Right. Um, Magic of the internet. Hold on, I'm just checking the sound real quick. Does that matter where it's facing? Yeah. Towards us? Uh, yeah. Oh. I'll, I'll adjust it as you, as you okay. go. Sorry, Ramon. We have... This is a technical operation here. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I noticed your two cats behind you on the bed. Oh, yeah, it's me, Paul and Cooper. They're so <laughs> cute. They love each other, don't they? Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're brothers. I don't know if cats can be twins, but I, they're from the same litter. So. Oh, man, that is, a, that is just perfection right there. <laughs> so thank I you. I didn't stage that, by the way. They just, that's just what they do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know from your Instagram account. And one of them's name is Meatball? Yeah. What's the other one's name? Uh, Cooper. Cooper, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so Ramon, thank you so much for this. I Don't really, ask really me. appreciate it. And our students really appreciate it. You can't see them here. Oh, maybe I could turn the screen around. Right there. But they're all here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> So uh, all we all pretty much follow you on Instagram, and I, um, God, I am so grateful for the information that you give on Instagram, of just the technical information, the artistic information about your own work, but also the work of 19th century draftsmen and painters. It's just, it's always a pleasure when you post. Thank you so much, Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for just having your Instagram up and like giving information to us. You know, I. Oh, thank you. You know, when you're when you're struggling with technique and trying to um, live up to the standards that were set in the past, these the very high standards, um, not only in the Renaissance but of course in 19th century art, um, you're just scrambling for any little information you can get about how artists drew and how painters, uh, what their working methods were and what their studying methods were. So, just thank you so much for everything. No, no, thank you. I'm going to introduce you real quick. Sure. Um, this is just from your from your bio on your website. Um, okay, so Ramon, Ramon Hurtado. Ramon is a contemporary landscape and genre painter living in Los Angeles. He studied drawing and painting under Will Weston, Glenn Vilpu, and Adrian Gottlieb while earning a BA at USC. He subsequently spent a year in Washington, D.C. studying figure painting with Robert Liberace. His current work explores the everyday mysteries of life in Los Angeles, along with extensive research into 19th century academic metho metho methodology. Ramon has exhibited at Principal Gallery, the National Cowboy Museum, the Autry National Center, and the USC Fisher Museum. He has taught and lectured at the Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art, the Safe House Atelier, CSU Long Beach, DreamWorks Animation, Brainstorm School, and Art, and Art Center College of Design. Thank you, Ramon. Yeah, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for also giving me, you know, a forum and uh, and space on Instagram to basically become a meme account, which is what I'm actually trying to do uh, <laughs> as time goes on, and to make my cats famous, which is every every LA man's dream. But um, but really, thank you all for taking time out of your day to you know come and listen to me nerd out about this, and you know thank you, Colleen, for inviting me, and special shout out to my boy Alex Sukas in the crowd. You the MVP fam. <laughs> but um, yeah, so should we should we get started? Sure, yeah. Okay, let's do it. So let me go ahead and share my screen so y'all get one last good look at Meatball <laughs> Cooper before they go. <laughs> That's so cute. All right, how do I do this again? Okay. All right, so do we see Thomas Huntington now? Yes. Can we full screen it? Yeah, could you, uh... Uh, sure. There we go. Awesome. Let's see, let's make sure this... Okay, awesome. So, I actually, I just wanted to 
that I show you these as these were ended up being the um, the the title images for the for the lecture. This is a uh, young, sweet, supple Thomas Huffington, uh, basically like a portrait that he probably painted for his mom, uh, showing him as an aspiring young young artist, you know, dreaming of going to the Col de Beaux Arts in Paris, right? He eventually went. He joined the atelier of uh, Alexandre Cabanel, who was one of the uh, three uh, atelier masters that were uh, appointed. Uh, the other two were Jerome and Gilles, who was probably the least well-known one. Uh, the ones that we hear about the most are Jerome and Cabanel in this early period, most because you know a lot of the documentation that we have actually comes from Americans, and they ended up being more popular with Americans. So in any case. You know, it's it's interesting because you, you look at this and it, I think people have this idea of the Ecole as this completely glamorous sort of shiny thing, and, and I think especially nowadays, like there's the kind of um, romanticizing of that of that past, um, especially because you know uh, on some level we feel sort of a sense of, of loss, um, but they're literally just like drawing on chairs. You know, like here's a chair being used as an easel. You know, there's like 30 or 50 guys in here. And basically, the, the routine of, of doing this, and, and by the way, in some of the studios, not so much these, but the independent ones, smoking was allowed. So there are some reports of people basically, um, people in the back not being able to see what was happening, like, or, or the model, because of this thick cloud of smoke from your neighbors. So a lot of them just ended up basically painting or drawing from whatever the person in front of them was drawing or painting. Wow. In any case, so from all accounts, basically doing all this not only makes you a fantastic draftsman and painter, it also turns you into this degenerate bohemian. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Huffington about like, well, like five years later, something like that. Um, oh my God. His palette and brushes are hung up over here and you know, he's basically just an absent field stupor. Oh <laughs> Which is, I mean, you think about uh, like Cecilia Bow, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe it was her mother when she finally let her, you know, let her go study in Paris. I think her parting words were, you're a Christian first, a woman second, and an artist last. <laughs> This is supposed to be a sort of warning, not to, probably not to associate with people like Thomas Huffington. This is also what turned you into that kind of thing. Uh, this is uh, Le Fer Rouge, which means the red iron. Uh, I mean, as you can imagine, you know, obviously studios get cold, Paris gets very cold, so they use a stove to, to heat up the studios. Now, the, the teacher would visit the studio twice a week. Right, and so you basically have a bunch of frat boys mm -hmm. running the studio day to day, and that's literally what it was. I mean, you had like these insane initiations and pranks and all kinds of things like that. And so, what this is supposed to be picturing is the initiation of a nouveau, or just a you know, a freshman, you know, the the latest person to arrive in the studio. Typically, typically. You know, the only thing that was supposed to happen is, you know, maybe they'd have to buy a round of, you know, wine and bread or whatever for everybody in the room, and they'd have to do, like, all the chores in the studio, like, you know, clean up and that kind of thing. Um, this is the sort of, sometimes it escalated, sometimes you had to get, you had to strip down naked and sing, you know, sometimes people would have, like, mock paint fights, and this Fair Rouge thing, I don't know if this actually ever happened, I sort of doubt that it did. But what they're doing is they basically got the poker that they would move the coals around with um, on the stove, and they made the newest student disrobe. And they're—I don't think they actually ever branded anybody. I don't think this actually ever happened. This is supposed to have happened in the Atelier of Jerome, but I believe this is just like a—you know—sort of like a fanciful painting. Regardless of whether this actually happened or not, it gives you kind of an idea of what the environment was like in the in the studios. You know, they weren't these really sort of like buttoned up, really formal kind of affairs. It was just, you know, a bunch of people like that were away from home for like the very first time and were under immense pressure, like working really hard. And, you know, a lot of them were also teenagers. 
you know, or like, I mean, at this period in the Cole's history, they were, um, they were all men. They were all men like in their 20s. And, you know, I think you can imagine what the, uh, what the environment was like in, you know, when you have like 50 guys who are fresh out of high school, you know, stuck in one room with a bunch of their friends and the teacher only coming by every now and then. So in any case, we're going to exit out of this. And this is just, um, you know, this is just like a picture of um, an unknown studio in the Ecole. Again, these things are a lot more makeshift than, uh, than I think we like to imagine. Like, if you look at a contemporary atelier, I've been to some where people have like really nice furniture and everybody gets their own station and they get like storage and all this stuff. <laughs> at least you wouldn't have any of that. You know, like half of, the, half of the easels, even if you see early pictures of like the Art Students League, you know, they would take two chairs, right? They'd like sit on one chair, flip the other chair over and use that as an easel. And that was, you know, that, that was it. In any case, with that little bit of uh, miscellaneous out of the way, let's hop into, uh, you know, the meat of this. Hey, uh, Raymond, could you close that window? Um, oh, the, yeah, this that, little window? Yeah, one. yeah, just so we can see the image fully. Uh, let me just, uh, I don't know if it oh, will there. let me. Okay, that's fine. No, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So these are the these are the drawings from this particular period. I mean, this is a this is a favorite period of mine, and this is the one that I've done the most reading about. So this is why you know I chose to talk about this rather than you know an earlier or a later period in the nineteenth century. You know, this is a drawing by you know old boy uh, Johnny Sargent. This is uh, you know he was like twenty something twenty twenty one. This is from eighteen seventy seven. He won a prize for this one. And here we'll just run through, you know, a couple of these. These are really, really typical uh, examples of cast drawings and figure drawings from the 1870s and the 1880s. We'll touch a little bit on some of the, your, you know, some of the years surrounding that, like late 1860s, you know, maybe a little bit past that. But this will be primarily our focus. So these are all basically done in the um, what they call the cours du soir, which is just the, it just literally means the night class. And that's what matriculating at the Ecole meant. Um, the Ecole wasn't really like a very, like I said, it wasn't a very formal institution in a lot of ways. Um, after the reforms of 1863, when the Ecole was basically, you know, sort of like uh, moved around and sort of reformulated in some ways, you basically had, because they didn't teach painting at the Ecole before 1863, you had to go to some independent atelier, just find someone to teach you, and then all the occult meant was that you got to go to a night class where, you know, one teacher would teach for like a month and then the next month you'd get a new teacher. So that's what being at the occult meant before um, 1863. Once 1863 rolled around, then they installed three painting ateliers at the actual occult grounds. And those are the, atel the ateliers of Jerome, Cabanel, and Pilt to begin with. Um, the ateliers remained, I mean, eventually, I believe Peels was replaced by Lehman. You know, eventually Bonin was teaching at the Ecole, but not, not during this period. Uh, the other major change was that instead of having rotating teachers, you know, for um, critiques in the drawing class, the night class, they basically just gave it to Adolphe Yvonne, who was um, a contemporary of, Jer of Jerome. He studied with the same teacher with Paul Delaroche, who we'll talk about a little bit in a second. But basically, these were pretty much all done during um, Yvonne's tenure. Like, Yvonne was teaching from 1864, you know, just the year after the reforms, to about 1883, where he just ended up moving on to um, one of the smaller schools in Paris. So this was all basically done under his influence, or at least the majority of these. And that's kind of the interesting thing, is that they actually, they might have been studying with a different atelier master in the mornings. You know, the hours were usually from, like, 7 to noon or 8 to 1 p.m. if it was in the in the winter, I believe. But they all had the same drawing class with the same person. And I believe Sargent was actually in that class. Um, but we'll talk about that more in a second. But you can see, I mean, just the general excellence of these drawings just throughout. I mean, these are all primarily prize-winning drawings. But the quality of these is, uh, is in some ways fairly uniform. This one's actually by uh, Bastien Lepage, who's a favorite of mine. Uh, we don't have that many drawings of his that remain from this time, and we have like 
we have this one and we have um, uh, there's like one other one and I think that's pretty much it and we have his uh, pre to realm entries but you know in terms of like figure paintings by him or like a painted academies there isn't a whole lot that's um, that's surviving so in any case you notice also there's like a certain uniformity in the approach uh, for these drawings that's something that we'll that we'll get into that we'll talk about a little bit later so I think we've gone through um, pretty much all of these you know, I'll just open up one of them just to mention a couple of things. Like in this period, this is from this is from 1881. This really is just like the height of you know the various uh, naturalist movements. It's a very specific kind of drawing that's created in this period. You know, they're they're basically portraits of models. You know, there's no attempt to. Um, I mean, obviously, for practical reasons, things have to be simplified. Uh, sometimes, usually, it was in the reflected light. Although you can see, by 1881, people were starting to to fully explore that as well, and they weren't shying away from even poses that were primarily backlit and that kind of thing. But you know, there isn't any real attempt to idealize the model. I mean, they're sort of taking the model, you know, as the as the model comes. And this is after you know. A, a variety of different influences had changed, um, you know, what an academy drawing looks like. You know, this is after photography. This is when photogra photography has been around for about 60 years at this point. You know, it's just like an established fact. And obviously, it's something that has, um, you know, in a fairly direct manner, you know, an aesthetic influence over drawings, regardless of whether the drawings are done from, done from life or not, which obviously these were. Um, so for a little bit of context, Let's just step back and actually take a look at some of the drawings that were done before these. So this is by one of the impressionists, actually. This is by uh, Basile. This was done in the uh, in the atelier of Glare, and these are by Charles Negret. Charles Negret was actually a classmate, and I believe a friend of Jerome's. And you know, he was a painter, obviously, but. He's actually most famous for being an early photographer. He actually just kind of, you know, he started using uh, photog uh, photographs as reference for his paintings, and then he just became a full-blown photographer after that. So you notice that even even this period, this is 1845. You know, these are from probably like 1842. You know, this is again maybe like a good like 10 years after the daguerreotype process is. You know, like it has been basically perfected. I mean, they have photographs at this time, and you notice that the drawings actually don't even look that different from that. You know, these are either executed in charcoal or black chalk. You know, they're clearly done with a stump, which is something that we'll get into in a minute. Um, and again, this is sort of very fairly typical work of a mid mid century um, mid century atelier. Actually, just to go back for a second. The reason why Glaze's atelier became popular was because Delaroche's atelier shut down. And the reason why it shut down was actually because of a prank gone wrong. Uh, during Jerome's tenure there, there was a new guy that came in. And the, the senior students tricked him into a duel. And they had um, so, so basically, they, they, they tricked him into, into, into getting him into, into a fight which was going to be like someone had a gun ready for him and a gun for the other guy. The gun only had blanks, but the senior student pretended to pretended to die. And this guy, the new guy, had been suffering from a from a fever. Right. So he'd been pretty much like sick already. So the guy so the guy just like up and dies like the like the new guy actually just dies for real. Right. And Delaroche had already been getting sick of the, his students antics. And that was just the last straw. Like he was so disgusted with what happened that he just he said, "You know what? We're done here. I'm not teaching anymore. I'm moving to Rome." So that's what he did. And uh, you can just imagine Jerome. Jerome was a student at the atelier, uh, the atelier at the time, but Jerome was like back home visiting his parents. So he comes back and he finds out that the studio is closed forever. So he had to scramble around. And in any case. Um, he moved to the, uh, Delaroche, set up some of his students in the atelier of Glare, who is a, you know, like a, a colleague of his. Glare's atelier is where the impressionists met. So it's it's sort of interesting to think that if this 
prank hadn't happened. I mean, Impressionism probably would have happened in, in one way or another, but maybe these specific people wouldn't have met in this specific place, right? Whistler was there, Monet was there, Basile was there, yeah. Renoir was there, and a bunch of other people who actually went on to make good paintings were also there. So, in any case, uh, Della Roche, who was Jerome's teacher, this is one of his academic drawings. This is an entirely different thing from, uh, or sorry, not Della Roche. This is Della Roche's teacher. This is uh, Gro. Gro is a student of Davi, right? So now we're going back, you know, we're starting to kind of reach into the, the very early 19th century or just about the late 18th century. And there was just a very different sensibility at the time where you, you basically had people like adding fanciful little things like an entire bowl. <laughs> Uh, or like whatever this is supposed to be, or a, a club. You know, this model is obviously hanging on to like a pole or a rope or whatever. But you know that because these drawings, these drawings weren't made to make a likeness of whoever your model happened to be. These drawings were made in order to create mythological paintings and religious paintings. You know, just you know, capital H history paintings. And so the, a, a, a perfect mimesis of the model was not something that was considered especially important in that sense, you know, these, these models are being seen through this sort of filter of the antique, you know, which David was instrumental in, in reviving. And if we just take a minute to, to reach even further, this is a drawing by uh, L'Epicier, who was actually a teacher and a student uh, of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, which is the institution that preceded the occult. The Ecole wasn't called the Ecole until after the French Revolution. So from 1648, if memory serves, to about 1789, it was just called the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. So, and I actually don't remember the book exactly, I'll, I'll try to look it up for you guys later on, but the poses at that school were something like six hours. You know, they didn't teach painting, you had to go and find a master on your own. But if you did uh, enter the actual, if you did matriculate into the actual school, then you would get to draw the model three times a week for two hours each, and that was basically it. And what's interesting is that those drawings, um, the poses are very different. They're much more adventurous because obviously a model can hold a pose like that for much longer than, um, or sorry, for you know they can hold a pose like this for that shorter time period rather than, you know, the sort of increased hours that, uh, that follow. So in any case, I mean, this is all just to show that this is not, um, there's almost no such thing as just 19th century academic drawing. These are more by uh, Lepicier, same guy. This is very typical 18th century French academic drawing. And it was, you know, not at all different from Russian academic drawing at the time, which was inspired by, you know, French academic drawing. I mean, this is just what academic drawing looked like at this point. You know, a lot of it was done on tinted paper. Some of, some of it was done doing, using a stump. You can see a little bit of that right here. Uh, some of it wasn't. A lot of it was done with, it seems almost an equal amount. Uh, you know, some were done with black chalk, some were done with, uh, some were done with red chalk. And by the way, this is the uh, Google Arts and Culture app. This is, um, well, I guess this is the website, but you can get it on your phone too. Basically, Google partnered up with a bunch of museums to offer high-res uh, versions oh of the materials in their collections. This is the same app that was, uh, if you ever saw like those selfies that popped up like a couple months ago, you know, where like uh, it'll like recognize your face and like match you up with someone who looks like you, but it never does a great job. <laughs> uh, it's the same app. It's just that it seems like very few people had bothered to do anything with it other than uh, take the selfies, <laughs> which I mean. No hate, you know, it's just uh, <laughs> just an observation. <laughs> By the way, like half of this stuff is actually from the Met. So, you know, I mean, you guys can like literally like after, like go tomorrow, you know, and, and check this stuff out. Probably not tomorrow, but, you know, if you set up an appointment, I'm sure that they'll let you go and see this stuff. So in any case, you know, this is, and again, here's some like other, uh, some other examples. This is a little bit older. This is an, eight, this is an 18th century, early 18th century um, Italian drawing. I mean, academic drawing, you figure that just drawing is a response to, you know, a variety of, um, 
of needs that people have to things that they the things that they want to express, right? And so, as those needs change for a particular society, you know, it, it can't help but be reflected in the drawings. So, in any case, uh, you, this is actually pretty cool because you can see the texture of the of the paper. A lot of these seem to have been done on uh, on a kind of laid paper that had like a like a grid like texture, kind of like a window screen kind of thing. So this wasn't the uh, perfectly smooth uh, paper that they were working on. So in any case, um, I'll show you just a couple of, uh, couple more before we get into um, to a few other things. These are by uh, Halil Pasha, who was a Turkish student of Jerome. He was at Jerome's atelier from like 1888, 18, I believe. So he was there for like a good long time. He was there for like eight years. And again, what's amazing about all this stuff is that you can zoom in super close. I mean, you can you can really come in and like see how these things were done, you know, to your heart's content. I mean, imagine being able to examine these things without a guard breathing down your neck. You know, that happened to me. I was chastised several times at the uh, at the Jerome show that came to LA a couple years ago for being much too close to the to the paintings. Wow. Wow. And the thing is that, like, I mean. As time goes on, like we're just getting more and more and more of these. Like, um, and the other amazing thing is that not only are we getting high-res versions of drawings, but you know we're getting just all kinds of information, all kinds of primary sources. Like, you know, where we really can. This really is becoming a kind of like living history. This this is sort of unrelated. This is a drawing by Adolf von Menzel, but just to show you the kind of. Um, commitment these museums have made to really making this stuff um, accessible for study. So I'll share this link with you guys. I just like I just made a collection basically of um, you know like a, of drawings uh, like, you know that you could I mean this is public so you can access it uh, once I send you the link. And um, just for funsies here you can take a look at this uh, where to go the little drawing by Bard also from the collection of the Met. Wow. It, like, it's, I mean, I've seen drawings by Barg in person. Like, they're a very different animal than the ones uh, in the book. You know what I mean? The, the ones in the book, like, that's, we'll get into this later, but I don't think that's necessarily a way of drawing. It's like, it's a, primarily a way of training. Um, the way that, you know, a trained, a fully trained academic painter actually worked, you know, when, when they weren't in school is, Tremendously different from what you see in the uh, in the uh, lithographs. Here's another one. Again, again by Arg. Again, available at the Met. Yeah, it's something you can go and uh, and check out. Oh, and this is actually so. This is uh, since we were just talking about Grow right now. So this is a drawing done by Richard Parks Bonington. This is a cast drawing that was done in Grow's atelier. You notice like, that the character of this is very, very different from the way the cast drawings look later in the century. Mm. And again, thankfully, this is like a tremendously um, high-res image. So again, I'd really recommend, uh, I mean, you can download the app right now. Uh, I would really recommend spending some time with this stuff. Um, and obviously, you know, I mean, this is all the stuff that happened like before, um, you know, before the drawing that we're going to be talking about. Here's some of the stuff that happened after, or some of the drawings that were made after. Because the Ecole, I mean, the Ecole existed, well, the Ecole exists now, you know, but the Ecole was teaching cast drawing and that kind of thing for many, many years after the 19th century. I mean, I've seen examples of work as late as the 1930s, and probably after that. You know, the pre de Rome itself didn't end until 1968, you know, when there were some widespread, uh, widespread student protests um, asking the curriculum to be reformed. This is, uh, this is an interesting one. This is by, so this, okay, so this is a drawing from 1898. This is one from 1927-ish, and this is by Zhu Bei Hong, who became one of the, I mean, if you're familiar at all with Chinese academic work, this is the granddaddy of Chinese academic work. He was one of the first Chinese students to go to Paris and one of the first directors of the Central Academy of Fine Arts, which is 
you know, still what I mean, probably the most prestigious school in China. Um, I mean, I'm guessing most of the training now is, you know, very heavily influenced by the Repin Academy in, in Russia in St. Petersburg. But they had actually a tradition developed before the Russians even arrived. There's one report, and I forget the name of the of the painter. It might have been Arkady Plastov, but I'm not entirely sure. He went over there in the 50s to teach Chinese students, and he reported back. He was like, I really didn't have a whole lot to teach them. They were doing just fine. So, in any case, um, those Zhu Bei Hong drawings, actually, some of them have been digitized recently. So you can actually go through and check some of those out in that same collection that like I said, I'm going to send you all a link to. And again, just the standard of these images recently has been, you know, just completely um, exploding. So in any case, we're just going to set that aside there. So I just wanted to show you a couple of uh, a couple of works by some of the teachers. So the uh, the primary teachers at the uh, at the Ecole were, you know, Jerome obviously. I think you know a lot of people are familiar with his work. It's interesting to look at the drawings too. Like I said, the the way that people actually drew uh, when they were working is, you know, strikingly different from you know the way that people were working in the ateliers themselves. Also, he did a lot of these silly dog paintings. Oh, I love that one. Boy? Yeah, his, his name is Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that painting. I mean, like, this is, like, probably the least imaginative thing I've run into since um, the painter Solomon J. Solomon. Mm -hmm. You know, his parents must have been, uh, and maybe they were the ones that named that dog. This is uh, some work by Cabanel. This is him, actually. This is a sad looking Adam uh, study for uh, Paradise Lost, where uh, Adam and Eve get uh, kicked out of paradise. This is a working drawing by Cabanel. So, like, a bunch of the people that were, you know, in these uh, classes, like, for instance, let's pull up uh, Belanger. Actually, no, not that one. Belanger. See, for instance, like, Belanger was a student of Cabanel. And so he was probably learning how to do this. He was also a student of Yvonne, right? But he was learning how to do this from someone who drew like this, or at least in, um, in their actual work, drew like that. This is a cartoon by Cavanaugh. This is um, you know, just preparatory work for a final painting. So you can see traces of that old idealizing tendency in, um, in these drawings, even though they were training people whose primary impulse was to, you know, represent, you know, quote unquote, like the world as they, as they saw it, um, you know, objectively. And the last guy that, you know, pretty much gets no love is Isidore Peels. And he's a pre de Rome winner. This is uh, the painting that he won with. And he just, you know, solid painter overall. Yeah, I wish we actually had time to get into some of the painting stuff. I mean, you know, we, we probably won't. But, um, but you, you can see some examples of his sort of uh, his working process. You know, heavy on the stump in here. And these I can send out. I can just make like a little, uh, little folder to put up. Um, since I've been talking about Della Roche, I'll just show a couple of examples. This is a figure painting by Della Roche. This is probably actually just a, an academy from the model, just with like the addition of uh, the arrow and you know the maybe like the drapery to make him a Saint Sebastian. This is part of uh, the Enicicle, which is actually in one of the lecture rooms at the Ecole. When I went there, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before that, uh, I had an appointment with um, Emmanuel Schwartz, who's I think his title is the protector of the patrimony. Basically, he's the curator. He's like the chief curator at the Ecole. And um, phenomenal guy, by the way. Um, so in any case, uh, when I went in there, I was I got there early and I was just kind of waiting and the door was open to one of the lecture halls. So I just walked in. 
uh, I walked around for like a little bit. I got a some video of a uh, of the Emicicla and like you know got a got a real good look at it. Uh, I come to find out later that the only reason that room was open was because uh, some people were coming by. Uh, to do like a, like some uh, conservation specialists were coming by to examine this like super valuable Ang painting. So I definitely was not supposed to be in there. But you know what? I didn't even see the Ang painting. I didn't even, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> I was engrossed in the Della Roche, so I didn't even uh, I didn't even take stock of it. I could have walked away with it, but uh, you know it wasn't in, it wasn't in the cards. So in any case, you know this is. Um, this is a little bit of like the, the, the context, right? Uh, Ivan, who will have plenty, plenty to say, uh, say about, this is some of his work. Like I said, he was a student of Delaroche too. He was a contemporary of Jerome's. Uh, this one's in the US somewhere. This is called The Genius of America. He was primarily known actually as a battle painter. Like he painted a bunch of scenes of uh, various wars in Russia. Now the interesting thing about him, well, among many things, is that he was actually, uh, there's a quote here from this book where he's actually credited with initiating the emergence of charcoal as a primary drawing medium. So according to uh, Georges Musnier, Ivan came back from Russia with like a bunch of charcoal drawings and you know people looked at him and they thought, hey, that's cool, let's do that. Wow. Because a lot of the earlier coal drawings were actually done with black chalk, mm. right? You know, black chalk, I, I'm not exactly, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in that. And I, what I believe happened is they started running out. And so they started looking for alternatives. Charcoal was one of them. Eventually they made the synthetic uh, Conte crayons, which have been around for a long time. I live really close to a fire station, so you just have to excuse the, excuse the noise. And here, let's pull up. Uh, this is one of the, the, the really interesting things about the Ecole. Like I said, you had the independent studios or the teacher studios, and then you had the nighttime class. So you could actually, for admission, just go up to one of the teachers, show them, show them your work, and if they wanted to, they could let you in if they had room, right? That's one way of getting into the call. But that wouldn't grant you access to the actual life drawing class. I mean, you could obviously you would do life drawing, life painting at the studio in the morning, but if you wanted that sweet, sweet nighttime class with Adolphe Vaughn, then you had to matriculate. Now, the matriculation process was this insane trial by fire. And this is my girl Phoebe Nat describing this in 1881. A painter applying for admission must execute an anatomical drawing at the school in two hours, a perspective drawing in four hours, and a drawing from the cast in three sittings of two hours each. He must also pass an examination in, in history, in general history, oral and written, at his own, at his own option, and make a study from life in 12 hours, two hour poses for six days being allowed him. So that, that, that's just to get in. And that's just to get in, period. And actually, if you read some of uh, John Singer Sargent's letters, he actually uh, documents part of this process. Um, part of it, too, was actually a language, uh, a French language test. Right, so they expected their students to be fairly well-rounded in terms of, uh, you know, have some, nation, some basic notions of drawing but also be fairly well rounded in terms of like knowing history, knowing like basically mythology and stuff like that. And but this is the real kicker, you know, the 12 hour drawing. Now, like I said, drawings of the Ecole used to be six hours. After David took over the whole thing, he extended the number of, of hours and basically made it so that students were drawing six days a week, right? So he doubled the hours, but they kept the time at just two hours per session. So. <clears throat> Let's say now, now the hours at the actual ateliers themselves were different though. So that 12 hour limit, that was for competitions and that was for the nighttime class. So if you, you know, if you go back to these, these are pretty much all 12 hours. Now I've heard some reports that they used to alternate one week they would do a figure from the antique and one week they would do um, a figure from life. I believe that by 1863, they were doing three weeks of life drawing and one week a month of, uh, of drawing from the antique. Okay, so it was a fairly constant thing that they were, that they were doing, and again, they had prizes for it. You know, these are all uh, prize-winning drawings. Now, the hours at the ateliers themselves, like in the morning, 
you know, here Phoebe's talking about, uh, you know, the hours are uh, 7 till 12 and the pose of six days duration. So the way that I've heard it articulated in other sources is that basically, you know, you get five hours, but one hour is rest, right? Like different intervals of rest. And you get the model six days a week. So basically, functionally, you're getting four hours each day. So you're getting 24 hours of uh, working with the model. So again, on average, those poses for painting or for drawing, they were 24 hours in the, in the actual atelier work, but for competition, they were half that. And there are just like a variety of reports that, uh, that corroborate this. So for instance, if we check out, if you hop to this book, these are the Lectures on Painting by Edward Armitage, delivered in 1883. He was actually a student of Delaroche, just like Jerome. And he actually just goes in detail about this. He talks about, um, one of his lectures is actually just about drawing, period. These are super cool, by the way. You can actually, like most of the stuff that I find, I find on archive.org. Somehow someone took it upon themselves to make this one into an audio book. So you can actually listen to this one. And this guy with like this like, uh, this sort of like David Attenborough-esque voice like reads it to you and it's amazing. So in any case, uh, he says, the model used to sit for six consecutive days, from 7 to 12 in the summer and from 8 to 1 in the winter, which is exactly what Phoebe said in the previous one. Um, and an hour was allowed every day for interval, intervals of rest. During the whole first day sitting, nothing but drawing was done. Sometimes the shades of the figure were rubbed in with bitumen or some transparent brown, but no color was ever used. The master would come in early on the Tuesday, and until he had passed, as it were, every student's drawing no one who studied seriously would think of laying on color. Six hours, therefore, out of the 24 were spent before the actual painting began, but at any rate, good solid foundations had been laid. Well-proportioned and carefully drawn figures were the rule and not the exception, and if the student had not time to finish his work by the end of the week, he would have, at any rate, a large portion of the figure carefully studied. Okay, so that's, again, I, I'll, I can actually... Um, what I was thinking of doing over the next um, over the next couple of months is actually on my website putting up all of these books since they're just completely in the public domain, absolutely free. So I think I might just start compiling them and have some notes on like what's interesting about each book. Um, so I'll keep you all posted about that, and obviously I'll post about that on uh, on Instagram as uh, as time goes on. So speaking of the actual uh, time setting for these. In England, hop over to England for a second. In the, in England, they had this system called the South Kensington system, right? And basically, what what South Kensington was was an array of provincial art schools, like all throughout the country, and they were primarily intended to actually train artisans. But you know, they were. Um, I forget if they were free. I think they might have been free. So at any rate, like a bunch of uh, people who, were, who wanted to be painters just ended up going to these schools, right, for primarily elementary instruction. Now, one of the issues is that at a certain point, I mean, the South Kensington system was very heavily regimented. And it had like, it, it's actually a lot more similar to the work that's done in, the, in contemporary ateliers than what was done in the Ecole or, you know, or, or a place like Antwerp. So they would do these very, very finished drawings, uh, things like this. You know, they had a very, uh, a lot of work from the cast. And this is, I think, from like 1908. I mean, they were still doing this for like a good, good long time. The issue is that students started getting real sick of the system. So they started leaving. You know, like a bunch of them started uh, leaving England and going to study in, you know, Paris, a lot of them. But a significant number of them actually started going to uh, Antwerp in Belgium. And it's just interesting to see like how people conceived of art at the time. Um, now, what they did is they actually got, like in England, they got the, uh, let's see, what was his uh, official title? They got the headmaster of the National Art Training Schools to visit Belgium and Germany to evaluate their systems of teaching. So this guy, John Sparks, just went on this tour, right, of the schools in, uh, in Belgium and, and Germany to figure out like what they were doing and how that compared to what they were doing in England. And 
this is you know this is what I'm calling the Sparks reports, right? So it, this is basically just like a government thing. Like he's re, he's you know he's a he's an agent of the government. He's like reporting to his superiors about uh, the state of instruction, basically. And he had some really interesting things to say about um, the training in South Kensington and in England generally, and how it compared with the training in in, uh, in Antwerp. So let's see. Um, Talking about it here. Okay, so he says the second step in this course of outline is where the student draws the whole length figure, still from copy and outline, so they're drawing from engravings, on which the proportions are marked. While still in the elementary section of the, uh, while still in the elementary section, the student copies a drawing of a head or torso done by some past student or perhaps a professor, with a view of learning the quickest method of laying in a drawing. Therefore, the stump is employed with a restricted use of chalk added to it but nothing like our method of stippling is permitted. And the head is treated in the largest, broadest method of light and shade. No reflections, which is what they called reflective light back then. No reflections are represented and only the largest half tints are expressed. It is an exercise to help the student master his material while at the same time, he learns to see the model in the simplest masses. So then he goes on to talk about um, part of the curriculum and he says, the advanced section of the middle course is drawn from the whole antique figure. Each figure is placed for eight days and is worked out two hours every day. Therefore, 16 hours is the whole time allowed for the completed work. The exception to this is only when figures are drawn for competition, then 20 hours are allowed. The additional time being given in consideration that the student receives no advantage from the professor's supervision. So basically, his, his conclusion is that the time limits imposed on students make them significantly more effective in working. And that's part of the reason why people were leaving England to go study in Antwerp. He goes on to talk about the painting class. And in the painting section, he said, the head is painted in 11 hours. The model sits on two consecutive days for five hours and a half each day. The torso is painted in 20 hours on four days. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, if you look at the work from Antwerp, I mean, it looks really good. You know, they don't suffer that much from, I mean, 20 hours for a torso is pretty fast. You know, in Paris, they allowed, uh, for the torso competition, they allowed, I think, 42 hours. But the ones in Antwerp, I mean, they're not always, like, the best quality. I mean, some of them aren't. Like, this one's, you know, this one's pretty good. They're pretty big. I mean, they're almost life-size. This one's preserved in England, not preserved very well. I mean, you can see that it's, you know, sort of falling to pieces. This is by uh, Herbert Wilson Foster. And you can see some examples of the handling. The handling is pretty vigorous. You know, these are not works that are finished to the nth degree. Certainly not like the work that was expected of people in South Kensington. And this is actually a, a winning pre to Rome work from the Antwerp Academy. Now, if you want to get a fix of some Antwerp work, you can actually check out, um, I think the New York Academy just purchased a painting that's actually like a, I'm pretty sure it's an Antwerp painting, and they have it just on display like as soon as you walk in. Uh, so if you want to, you know, take a stroll down there, that's probably the, the fastest way to, to get a look at one of these things. These are actually by Albert Edelfeld. These are, these are done before the really famous ones that he did in, the, in uh, Jerome's Atelier. And these are figure drawings by Edelfeld that were done in Antwerp. So these are 16 hour drawings, you know, about 18 by 24, same size. Um, this is by Anselm Furbach. Again, more Antwerp work. Again, not all of them great. You know, this is, this is like, a, this is Edelfeld's first painted no study way. from the model. No way. <laughs> Baby Edelfeld getting started, yep. And what's interesting is actually, I think the main thing that they learned when they went to Paris, especially students from more like sort of regional schools or from places like this, was that in Paris, there was a much greater concern for um, evaluating, you know, the values of the entire figure, like getting, you know, the exact color and the exact value, which I'm sure they were aiming for to some degree here. But I think that in Paris, people paid a lot more attention to just the, uh, what they call the ensemble just the overall orchestration of the entire thing. The interesting thing about Antwerp is that they had a class in animal painting. You could choose to basically major in genre painting. They never painted the entire nude figure for some reason. 
they painted torsos, and then they painted uh, fully clothed like uh, genre scenes. So this is one of the what they call the uh, group. So this is a lady and her child. And you can see just rows and rows and rows of these academic paintings back here. Here's another one that someone clearly didn't like. This is another one by this is by Leo Van Beers, the same model as the um, same model as uh, this one. Okay, so that's Antwerp, right? And again, it's just interesting to read about like the actual limitations that were imposed. My thinking is that the actual um, work with the stump is a, a huge portion of what allowed people to work so quickly. This is, um, what we have in front of us now is an article by Jane Sheehy, or sorry, Jean Sheehy. But this was, I found this in college, and it, it's, it was a real eye-opener. This is how I found out about the Sparks reports, because she, she mentions them in the, uh, in the article itself. She gives a brief history of the Ecole and basically how it was set up. You know, she talks about um, a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. But then she has some like contemporaneous reports about interesting things about um, the Antwerp Academy, and the article is just about you know why students leaving Britain and going to Antwerp, right, to study there. So one of the interesting points made there, and this was made by Edward Pointer, who was one of the um, basically he was uh, Sparks's boss, right? He was in charge of the Slade School too. He was just a, a student of Glare, right, who we talked about earlier. He was just a, you know, just a, a good general academic painter. So in any case, uh, let's see, they're talking about the hours for the uh, antique class, and the same stuff that we talked about, the 16 hours for, uh, for a drawing. And let's see. Now, in the Royal Academy and in the South Kensington schools, they didn't actually have time limits for their, for their works. And so, Let's see, uh, in the South Kensington system, the only time limits were in the life class, and they depended upon the length of time a model could be expected to pose. Otherwise, students were expected to work on a drawing until it was perfect. Edward Pointer claimed that few of the drawings sent for competition to South Kensington from the provincial schools of art had been executed in under six weeks of painful stippling with chalk and bread. So basically, they were, you know, working, like the backgrounds would take like two weeks a lot of the time of just... You know, careful system of dots, just you know, tap, 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 tapping the drawing until it was so perfect. Familiar. It's like a cast drawings. <laughs> and high finish was. I, I'll just let the pointer say it because it's just it, it's it's really the thing that I love about this is how candid these artists are. Like you can you can pick up a copy of Edward Pointer's ten lectures on art, and yeah, you, know, you basically don't have to have the the mediating uh, presence of an academic. You know, like a, like an art historian, I mean, telling you uh, what these people think. These people literally will tell you exactly what they think because they publish lectures about this stuff. So basically, Pointer, you know, you know, as Jane Sheehy writes here, he blamed the schools of the Royal Academy, which by requiring highly finished drawings from the antique as proof of proficiency before admitting a student, encouraged them to consider trivial minuteness of execution of more importance than knowledge of form. Okay. So what does Pointer have to say about how, you know, this is what Pointer doesn't want. So what does Pointer want? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's see if he'll tell us. So, typing, let's see, so, okay, so here's Pointer's 10 lectures on art from uh, 1880, and he says, um, I have no hesitation in saying that I believe most of the want of perception of unity of tone among our artists to arise from the common habit of laborious work with the chalk point. This use of the point, at all events, in a way which is prevalent in our art schools, not only involves loss of time and the sinking of, study, and the, sinking of the study of form and tone in that of mere execution, but concentrates the attention of a student on minute details which blind him to the general effect. It is for this reason that I have always advised my students to make use of the stump rather than of the point in shading their drawings. For the former, while it allows of any amount of finish of modeling, lends itself particularly well to the production of broad effects of tone, and is moreover much easier for a beginner to manage than the complicated method of shading with the point. 
here he's probably referring referring to the to the older uh, system of uh, cross hatching that uh, that people used um, in the past. Uh, let's see. There is, it is true, an intelligent use of the point in drawing, which proceeds naturally from the study of the construction of a figure. But it should be, con but it should, yeah, it should be contracted in actual drawing from the figure, and the lines made in shading with the point should always be indicative of the construction. Any student who shows a disposition to work in this way with the point should be encouraged in the use of it. But for the majority, the stump is by far the best means of learning to shape. So this is just like a general consensus that we find like throughout various authors. Like if we consult John Collier's manual of uh, oil painting, uh, he has uh, some things to say about that too. So let's see. He says, although it is not strictly within the province of his handbook, yet it may be as well to give a few hints as to the sort of drawing that is especially useful as preparation to the practice of figure drawing. In the first place, anything like elaborate stippling or indeed any finicking work should be absolutely a shoot. The figure should, should be carefully modeled, but the effect should be got in the simplest and broadest way. For this reason, I strongly recommend that the shading should be done with the stump. The effect will be more like that of oil painting than any work done with the point could be, and the execution is also not dissimilar. It is also a very speedy process, which is not a thing to be despised. For although a painter should never be in a hurry, yet he should always wish to do his work in the shortest possible time. There is too much to learn in painting for any man to allow himself to dwaddle over. So he, so he should never do in 10 minutes what he can do equally well in five. Mm -hmm. Of course, it must also be recollected that he should never do in five what he can do better in 10. So a lot of this is just like, really, it, it's, to me, it's surprising how consistent this, um, this um, directive to, to work with in, in the most uh, expedient way possible and to work in, you know, in, in the broadest way possible is, right? You, you're getting people from different schools, like John Collier studied in Munich, um, he was significantly younger than Edward Pointer, and he's saying literally the same thing, right? The only person that disagrees that I found is Harold Speed. But Harold Speed hadn't even been born at this time. Harold Speed is a representational painter, but I wouldn't really consider him an academic of the same type as, as these painters um, in the past. You know, as with anything that gains any kind of widespread popularity, there's always going to be this kind of uh, backlash. You know, Harold Speed is the guy in the 80s that hates disco. You know, I mean, that's basically what it is. I mean, why would he have such a virulent response against the stunt? Because what does he say? He says, um, Look, the less is said about the stump, the better, although I believe it still lingers on in some schools. Well, for context, like when he was, uh, when he was studying, basically there had been a, a huge revival of line drawing in England, and particularly of constructive drawing. And that was spearheaded to some degree by Pointer, to a larger degree by Alphonse Legros. So you get these drawings that basically just look like Raphael drawings, you know, and, and steered completely away from the kind of naturalistic, um, what I think Harold Speed even characterizes the excesses of naturalism, you know, in the in the late nineteenth century. So that's a bit of context to just kind of um, kind of situate that. Now, okay, let's say that we accept that these things were done with the stump because of the overwhelming mountain of evidence uh, in in favor of that. So how do we actually do it? Well. Frank Fowler published a book in plain English that literally just goes into like everything you could possibly want to know about how to do this. Wow. That's he talks about the paper, he talks about the, he, I mean, he has pictures of stumps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he just has like everything. Now, okay, fine. Who's Frank Fowler? Frank Fowler was a student of Cavanell, of Corrales Duran, and of Adolphe Vaughn. So he was literally in the same room as these people. He was one of them, right? And so the interesting thing is that, uh, well, it's interesting that this hasn't like really uh, like picked up, you know, because the guy's like literally going through like how to actually do it. So um, the one problem with this book, it's free online. It's like completely free. You can find it literally right now. If you just, uh, if you just Google uh, drawing in charcoal and crayon for the use of students in schools. Now the problem is that this book is supposed to come with a bunch of plates. 
right? It's supposed to come with eight plates where Frank Fowler walks you through how to train. The plates are not available in any copy that you find online. That's weird. And it's actually easy enough to find a copy of this book, like, like an original copy of this book in a number of art libraries. <clears throat> but again, it always comes without the plates. So, in preparation for this talk, I made a couple of phone calls, and I present to you for the first time in God knows how long, Fine. No way! Now, spoiler alert, they're actually not that good. <laughs> they're actually really clear. They actually look a lot like the barred plates. Yeah. So, plate number one, plate number two. That's, that's very okay, he has an explanation of the plates in the book, so I'm going to publish this on my website so that <gasps> they can have access to it. Oh, man, that is so cool. So, he's just going step by step by step. His idea is basically, well, not his idea because it's probably not even his. You know, you, I mean, you lay in your drawing, you know, in sort of in the usual way, this is not that different from Bard, and you lay in the charcoal in, in parallel lines, and then you run the stump over so that you get a flat, even tone. For the half tones, you don't actually touch the charcoal to the paper. Right. What you do is you take the stump and you drag the charcoal from the shadows into the lights. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, if you need an additional charcoal, then what you do is you, you basically make a little patch on the side, you rub off some charcoal, and you pick it up with the stump so that the charcoal never actually touches the half tones on its own. It's kind of, it's a lot, it's just like painting. You know, you don't actually grab the paint and literally smear it on, uh, on your canvas. You, know, you use a, a, a paintbrush to put it on. It's the same thing. You can think of the stump as a paintbrush and as a charcoal as paint that you're picking up and then you're then applying. One of the cool things that he talks about is um, also, at a certain point, rubbing a little mid-tone of, uh, of charcoal over the entirety of the lights so that you can then pick out the lights with bread. Yes. Now, they didn't have neither erasers back then, so Frank Fowler actually even talks about the kind of bread that you should be using. Oh it should be at least day old and it should not have any milk or butter in it. Okay? <laughs> So go out and buy some bread with, with some tent and make sure that it is at least a day old. And you can only use the inside part, not the crust. So here's another one. And here's another one. And actually, as far as these go, these are actually pretty decent, right? And then for some reason, he just completely craps out for the figure for the cast ones, like the, the full figure ones. Like, I don't know. And, the, and then there's like one they did from light. Oh. Now... I want to read you all what he says about this because it's like actually pretty amazing. Um, he says, in his own words, that plate eight, plate, this plate represents a study of the male figure taken from life and is a most carefully finished drawing in every respect. <laughs> oh my gosh. I Frank, seriously? In every respect. Okay. <laughs> but you can see where he's picking out the lights and stuff. I mean, regardless of the actual quality of these drawings as drawings, this is the best account that we have of someone who is literally there, who is writing this in plain English. He was a guy from Brooklyn. In plain English, how this was being done. Right? And so, now with that in mind, it, it's interesting. It's one of those things where like, once you hear it, you start seeing it literally everywhere. Right? And so, here I have a folder of stumping examples. This one's a Spanish drawing by uh, Rafael Romero de Torres, who made some really, really fantastic work um, until he died super young, which seems to have been a, a recurring theme with, especially the artists that I like. Um, but in any case, you can see actually, and, and by the way, one thing I should mention is that these drawings weren't just done with the stump and charcoal. Once the stumping was, was um, well actually, I mean, the, the, the crayon, like, a, like literally just like a 2B Conte crayon, was used in addition to this, right? So you can read the Fowler book, I'll, I'll send out the links, but basically what he talks about is you do your outline in charcoal, then once you're pretty happy with that, you just reinforce it with the, uh, with the crayon, right? And then you fill in your uh, shadows with the charcoal, you, know, you start doing your modeling, then you, you know, when you're satisfied with that, then you go back over the shadows with the Conte, because the charcoal doesn't get dark enough, right? And so you go back over the shadows with the Conte, and then if you want, you can actually do some hatching with the with the Conte on top, and you can pick out axes and stuff like that. So, 
the clearest illustration that I've found of that, and you can really start seeing it after a while, is this. This is a drawing from 1866 by Gabriel Ferrier. Yeah, and you can see the charcoal here, right? You can see the charcoal, and then you can see the crayon on top. Okay, and I bet you this is the this is the Conte over here, right? So this this image is from uh, the Getty. This is like a 7,000 pixel image. Like this is, I mean, wow. you can like start switching atoms on this. Thing. <laughs> so it's like it gives you an indication of just like how much work was expected of people, but it's really not that much. You know, it's not. These are not like I said. Just this is a 12 hour drawing. Like you know, time management becomes everything in these things. Now. I actually got the chance to go to uh, to go to Harvard a little while back and to to pull out some of their academic drawings because of course they have a collection of those. You know, you don't get to be the school with the biggest endowment in the world and not have a little bit of everything, right? And so they were super nice. That I really recommend that you go. Yeah, this is at the top floor of the Fog Museum. You only have to fill out an online form to to go. And they have this beautiful, beautiful room of natural light for you to, to, um, to examine this stuff in. And they're super laid back. Like they're not, uh, they're not like breathing down your neck about it. So this is by, um, this is by Belanger. Belanger, if you remember, is uh, the author of this drawing. Okay, now, we, now the Ecole hasn't posted very large images of these, so we'll have to settle for this one. But basically, here's a cast drawing by him. And here's some close-ups. You can literally see where the Conte ends and the charcoal begins. Right? And you can see like all of these little um, all these little Conte marks on top. Now this is a drawing that was, you know, I mean it's a typical Ecole drawing, and it's a good one too. But you notice how simply elaborated these are. Now, these are not especially fussy. I mean, I would bet that this is actually the Conte in here. But the thing is that the materials themselves actually don't matter that much. I mean, as long as you get something that is spreadable, I've done this with like Sanguine, I've done this with like a bunch of other materials, you can do this with Pastel. Um, a friend of mine um, who's from the St. Petersburg Academy, Ivan Loginov, who's a fantastic draftsman, by the way, um, and he's on Instagram. He actually just published a video of his process, and it's um, uh, he uses char he uses graphite powder and he just uses his fingers like stumps. Mm -hmm. But uh, but in any case, in this Belanger, you can see like just how much I, I think that the hatching is actually at the student's discretion. He chose to use quite a bit of it here. But it's interesting how smooth these things look from a diff from a distance, and what they actually look like up close. Mm -hmm. What's funny about this? Is, I mean, look at that patella. Like you can see where Bridgman got this stuff from. Because Bridgman was a student of Jerome and of Boulanger. And I think maybe of Lefebvre, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Now, what's interesting is if you go to, let's say, the Art Students League, like their, their archive, and you look at the, the drawings that were done in Bridgman's class, they don't look that different from this. Like the drawings that were done were actual academic drawings, and then you see the classic Bridgman diagrams on the side. Now, the Bridgman drawings are a little bit more exaggerated, but it's not difficult to see how this kind of, that kind of work grows out of this, uh, this tendency. This is another one by Oscar Ferrer. This is from the, the, uh, the Academy of Julien, probably in Jean-Paul Jean Lorenz's class. And uh, uh, actually someone on Instagram pointed out that this is the same model as that, um, that academic uh, painting by Lion Decker. Oh, yeah. It's like the same guy, because they were in Lorenz's class, the both of them. Now, just as like a little aside, if you're not familiar with Jean-Paul Lawrence, um, I posted about him last night, but uh, um, let me pull this up because it, it just is like amazing how, uh, how good of a job they're doing with, um, with this uh, whole Google art project thing. This is some work by Jean-Paul Laurent. Okay, and again, obviously, you know, fantastic. I mean, it's like completely absurd, and and that's the other thing. Again, it's like there's this misconception that you know academic work was this really highly polished um, thing with these like immaculate surfaces, and that's just really not the case a lot of the time, especially the more naturalistic work, because obviously you know this is a historical painting sort of, 
but this is like mid 19th century to late 19th century um, sort of like historical reporting. You know, this is not a painting of, you know, like a mythological hero or something. This is a painting that's basically like a historical reconstruction, right? So it's it's imbued with this naturalist tendency that from the from the from the outset. Now, Jean Paul Laurent authored some like incredible studies. I mean, there's some of like the they're, they're, I mean, they're just phenomenal. Like, this is one of the, his studies for a painting. I mean, it's like absolutely incredible. Now, one really good source, by the way, for uh, information on this stuff is uh, James Gurney's blog. Mm -hmm. I used, I mean, I, I read his blog religiously when I was a student, and he's been, you know, among with a few other people like David Apatow, have been huge inspirations for me and like the stuff that I post on Instagram. I just say lit and fam a lot more than they do, but. You know, I mean, that's pretty much it. Like, they, uh, they, in the, like, around, like, 2010, like, 2007 to 2010, they were posting a lot of this stuff and just unearthing, like, all these really interesting um, documents. Now, if, uh, if, you ha if any of you have, like, an interest in pursuing this stuff more, by the way, the, the easiest way to do it, because I get asked a lot about this, like, well, how do you find all this stuff? You know, I, I think people think I have some kind of, like, oracle uh, at home. Books.google.com. I mean, that, that really is what it because they they've digitized so many books and all the 19th century stuff that you want is free. So let's just uh, stump drawing, and we'll get rid of all this uh, all this modern stuff. Let's go to tools. We'll go to free Google Books. Okay, uh, Scribner's Monthly examples of stump drawing. Objects of a darker hue may be darker hue may be chosen as subjects for stump drawing. Blah blah blah. Better for stump drawing. I mean, you just and then you just jump right in. I mean, that's awesome. And you you never know what you're gonna find. Like this one I've read before. This is uh, basically uh, an essay of, or not an essay but like an article about lithography. And one of the problems they had was that a lot of people worked with the stump, but they couldn't reproduce those drawings. Right, so because it was like it was hard to reproduce anything smudging, they needed to actually have the drawings like for lithographs uh, to be done with actual lines. So this is documenting a process by which stump drawing can actually be uh, reproduced through a, lith a lithographic process. And you can, I mean, there is no limit to how much you can nerd out on this stuff if you really want to. Like, I just found this in preparation for this uh, for this uh, conversation. Like, these are minutes of evidence from basically like an investigation. <laughs> Of um, it's just like a commission of um, let's see, it's called the reports from the commissioners. They're basically looking into the Royal Academy and the art education system in England. So they're they're putting a bunch of uh, people that are in charge of the arts in England on uh, not on trial exactly, but they're putting them on the stand and making them testify. So these are the minutes from that meeting. And so this is uh, Charles Landseer, who um, I posted on Instagram, and he was an animal painter. I posted on uh, on my uh, website and also on Instagram about the drawing that he and his brother made. Oh yeah. Like the guy that did these cadaver drawings, he's the guy that's being interviewed about this, and it's interesting because these are people like I think these are people from like the House of Lords or something. Like they don't know anything about art, so they're asking him like the most elementary questions, and it's great. Like for instance, one of the questions is. Does each student finish his work in the month, or is there always a fresh model with a fresh visitor? Because they had rotating teachers, a new teacher every month. And his answer was, his work is generally finished in the week. The model sits for six consecutive nights in one attitude, and the students, whether modelers, draftsmen, or painters, have to complete their work within that time. I think that latterly there has been a disposition to extend the time, which is optional with the visitor. But I mean, like, anything you could want to know about this, they grill them about everything. They ask him whether he thinks it'd be a good idea to just hire somebody to just be the teacher instead of having people rotate. They ask him if, like, if it doesn't happen sometimes that, like, one teacher says, like, this is great, and then the next one comes in and says, this sucks. Like, just anything you could possibly want. How long the poses last. Like, I mean, just everything. That's crazy. Now, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, well, we're over an hour, so I think we'll start just wrapping this up a little bit. But, um... Again, I mean, there's just no end to you know, how much stuff there is for us to talk about. I'll, 
I'll just real quick show you, uh, since these were all done in Adolphe Yvonne's class, the French drawings that we were talking about, well, Yvonne published a book. And, I mean, we have this available online. Uh, Darren Rossar put this up online. This is the original French copy, but Darren, back in, I think, 2014, um, basically crowdsourced the translation of the text. I think I had the honor of translating two sentences on the title page. <laughs> <laughs> but in either case, like you can get this book, and you know, again, it's by Adolphe Vaughn, like literally the person who was teaching the class, and it has some interesting things like this. Like he basically is telling his students or whoever's reading the book that it's a good idea to conceive of a cylinder when drawing the figure looking up or looking down. I mean, it's interesting because you know I've I've run into this uh, quite a bit where. There's this misconception that, you know, really uh, what I would characterize as like aggressively geometric drawing is sort of 20th century invention. And even the claim that it, it starts with Bridgman, and this is a thing that's been around for 500 years. I'm not saying that's how they taught at the Ecole. I don't think that's the case at all, actually. But through some means or other, students at the Ecole were learning structure. And they had a canon of proportions. That is something that they actually used to some degree. Uh, Frank Fowler goes into detail about it, right? And pretty much every text that I've seen from this period has some indication of this. Again, I don't think they were literally building figures out of cylinders and spheres, but the, the admonishment to think about it is definitely present. Now, again, interestingly enough, Yvonne belongs to an earlier tradition. Like, if you look at his drawings, it didn't really look a whole lot like the drawings that his students were producing. But even though they were under his direct charge, and part of the reason for that is that, you know, you don't just learn from your teacher. I mean, they're sort of like external um, influences, you know, things that are in the air, like, for instance, naturalism, photography, things like that, that, that I think influence the, the tenor and the aesthetic of the, of the drawings beyond just the, the teachers themselves. Here's a, here are a couple of interesting examples from the past, too. This is a really early like Davidian academic drawing. This is by Javier Fabre. Now, for some reason, Fabre never finished. Well, I mean, he finished some of them, but he left a bunch of unfinished drawings in like various states of completion. So here's one of them, and this is the kind of lay-in that they would make at that time. Now, you'll notice that it's actually like weirdly uh, stylized. This looks almost like a Roman coin or something. The, the whole point of something like this is to outline the edges of the forms that will be rendered later on. So fidelity to the model as we understand it now is not really a thing, not, not in that sense. You know, they're looking not so much to represent like um, as a specific person, but a sort of like figure with a capital F, you know, this kind of like somewhat more impersonal kind of a heroic nude. So here he goes. This is probably not done with charcoal. This is too early. This is probably done with black chalk. So here we go, filling the stuff in with the black chalk. And then start passing some stump over it. A little bit in here, sneaking it in there. Then a little bit more elaboration. And eventually you get, you know, a little bit of a chalk point on top of the stumping. And then, you know, final drawing maybe with some heightening in white. But again, if you scout around through these things, I mean, you can see the marks of the stump in a lot of these. You know, nothing else produces this kind of staining. I mean, this is like a typical stump mark right there. And in some places, like down here, you can see just like the charcoal on its own. I mean, you, know, you can see in places like just, you know, bare charcoal and then stumping. But again, this is like a much earlier form of, um, of figure drawing. You know, this is from like 1800, basically. Uh, later in the century, you know, the lanes got a little bit different. I mean, through here, this is still fairly form-based. This looks like a much more shape-based kind of laying, you know, and obviously this is in contrast to modern methods of laying in. This is, this is by Dennis Miller Bunker. This is done in Jerome's Atelier by 1883-ish. This one's different in that this is a much more optical kind of drawing. You know, there isn't the same care in terms of laying out the forms as you find in some of these earlier ones. And, I mean, it's not shocking because Dennis Miller, Dennis Miller Bunker basically had impressionist tendencies. 
This is the stump patch. This is ugly where people are picking up their charcoal and depositing it onto their drawings. And again, if you start looking, you start finding it in any number of drawings. Here's one by a Brazilian student. I wasn't able to find who this was by. But again, you have the same basic approach that Fowler describes. You know, here's a stump patch right there. This is an interesting example. This is by E.D. Harnitz. This was sent back to the Art Students League uh, from one of their students that was on scholarship. This one's not done with a stump. Okay, this one's like just the, the charcoal point. And so it's interesting to see the, the, the changes in character you know, between a drawing that's not done with a stump and one that is. This is, I mean, I can't imagine this is anything but a stump. I think this is a Brazilian drawing, and clearly it's not being very well taken care of. This is a Fortuny that shows a little bit of use of the stump in the back. This is another really early drawing. I mean, you can, you can just see it, you know, all throughout. This is, uh, again, the um, Gabriel Ferrier. Wow. This, this is without any stumping. This is just done with the point. And it seems like the stump went out of fashion at a certain point. Like, past, like, I mean, I don't know, I want to say, like, the past the 1900s. This is a drawing by Gustav Klimt, also done without the stump. This is just the pencil point. <laughs> But in terms of the, this is a drawing, I think, in Bridgman's class, right? So again, it's like not that different. I mean, more exaggerated than the uh, Cole drawings, but not that different still. And again, another example of a drawing done without the stump, this time from 1908 from the Ecole. It's a cast drawing by Aang. Again, eventually, it seems like people's lay-ins become more like this. They're more shape-based, where you see people putting in not so much the boundaries of forms, but the boundaries of the light effect. So the boundaries of the shadows, the boundaries of the shape. This is a really sloppy one by Julian Alden Weir, who was a friend of Sargent's and of Frank Fowler's. Now, I mean, the drawings, that's not a great drawing. I mean, by you know, almost any metric. But it is indicative of where things were going. Here's another stump patch. This is an earlier drawing by Anton Raphael Mengs. Again, quite a bit of stump in the back and another figure here as well. And actually what we can do is we can just hop over to, let's see, let's exit out of this uh, Jean-Paul Laurent. And we can check out some of those Khalil Pasha drawings real quick. So actually even before that, where this, there's an Italian drawing that's worth looking at. Pietro Gabrini is a big old stump patch up here. And then the drawing itself, you know, is basically stained on. And then just like a few little accents are picked out with uh, with some kind of crayon. I mean, this is like a fairly universal way that a lot of places work. Um, Fowler makes the claim that all the major art schools in Europe work that way. And so, I mean, it bears out. I mean, you find it like consistently. Here's um, Again, here's one of those Khalil Pasha drawings done in Jerome's studio. I mean, here it almost looks like it could use a little bit of crayon over the top. Uh, I actually found someone on eBay who's selling some of the original paper from back then, but it's like $180 a sheet, so I don't think it's actually worth it. <laughs> See, here's another Halil Pasha drawing. Here's the stump patch on the side. Again, just the amount of work that goes into these is, um, I think, significantly less than one might expect. Oh, and actually, check out that sweet meat braid on that uh, on that knee. <laughs> and here's another one. Again, I mean, you just find these consistent features popping up over and over and over in these drawings. It's interesting, too, because I think these are actually in a museum in Turkey. And I don't think that, you know, I mean, I don't think Turkey ever had that many academic painters. They had some. They had Osman Hamdi Bey and obviously Khalil Pasha and a number of other people. 
but uh, I think they take better care of their academic drawings because they don't have as many of them. You know, like, I mean, it's the situation starting to change here in the States, but I mean, you don't find, like, um, I mean, those things are generally just in storage, you know, and they're not, uh, I don't think they get paid that much attention, which again is, is, is changing now. But, um, but in any case, oh, actually, here are a couple from the Mexican Academy, which is uh, apparently actually the first academy in the Americas. And again, this is no stump. The stump showed up a little bit later in, um, in, in their work over there. Now, I think that, uh, you know, we could open up some time for some, uh, for some Q&A. Just before that, I just want to show you uh, just one last, uh, one last thing that I think is, uh, is worth looking at. So James Gurney actually posted about this, these articles in uh, this magazine called The Nation. A lot of the stuff that I get, I get actually from old art magazines um, that are published online like contemporaneous 19th century magazines. So these are actually just a bunch of critiques that Jerome would give his students. So this is probably my favorite one. Um, your color rages, said the master. That of the model is lambent. Besides, your figure is tumbling. It is not on its legs. I will save you labor by telling you the simplest way of correcting this. Turn the canvas upside down and draw it over. The error is radical. <laughs> wow. That's a sick burn, right? Uh, <laughs> But it, it, there's actually, a, I wish we had a little bit more time actually to go into some of these, because um, in Antwerp, there's some anecdotes about uh, Joseph Van Lirius, who was one of the main painting teachers, where um, he comes by a student's work and he says, oh my, what a charming bit of color on that forehead. You know, the student's like, you know, perking up and it's like, oh wow, we're doing a great job. And before he knows it, Van Lirius takes the uh, palette knife and scrapes it off and he says, do it again. I want to make sure that it wasn't done by chance. Wow. <laughs> it's like that. Hey, nice to be mad in class, right? Wow. That's hard for. <laughs> so, in any case, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably just leave it at that as far as, uh, as far as this presentation goes. And, you know, I just want to say that thank you to all of you for, uh, again, for taking the time and for listening to this. You know, I hope you... Uh, I hope you enjoyed my uh, my nerdy ramblings about painting. Thank yeah. you, uh, thank you, Ramon. Thank you. Questions? Anyone want? You don't to mind, actually. I'm going to take a quick break and go to the bathroom, and then okay. my comeback. Questions. Yes, that sounds good. All right. Wow, that was a lot of info. Now, how are we going to draw tomorrow without stumps? That's what I want to know. How the hell are we going to do that? Everything will be stumps, right? <laughs> <laughs> the crops he stumps. Yeah, exactly. And those velvet stumps, that's what we got to get. <laughs> Man, that's amazing stuff. I got to get that Frank Fowler book. Yeah, so he's going to give you a lot of this uh, Right, on his internet, stuff. yeah. But archive.com is pretty good. Yeah, Wait, say that again? said the 12 and 16 hour drawings. I know. And no, we got 20 hours, so. You're too nice to come back to town. <laughs> Maybe I should chop off one uh, one one day. Yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Scrape that. <laughs> Turn it this upside down. This is dangerous. Down. We have a class tomorrow. <laughs> 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 oh, oh right. Yes, on Thursday. She <laughs> 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 was like, start away. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> start again. <laughs> Yeah. No excessive modeling. It's going to happen to our cast drawings now. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is so sensible. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have an idea of how we can get the links to the folders that you put together? Yeah, did he say he's going to send us? Oh, yeah, I, oh yeah, he's, I'll not. make sure he sends it to either me or Eric, and then if it's not already on his website, I'll send it to you guys. Thank you. You can give me your email. Okay, yeah. It's a small enough group. I think I know all of you guys.
right? <laughs> oh, is he back? Hey, hey, Ramon. Ramon. Okay, so I have one question. Um, in uh, contemporary um, atelier and art school um, environments, uh, faculty members will demo for their students. Mm -hmm. This is common today. Um, do you think that they did that in the past? It doesn't seem like they did, but I wanted your opinion. Do you think teachers like Jerome or Delaroche or Cavanell would have sat down and drawn in the so, class environment? So I think it, it depends on like where exactly uh, on the timeline we're situated. So in the days of the Academy Royale, like in the 17th and 18th century, part of, like if you were a visitor, right, if you were a member of the Academy, and you were called upon to teach for like a month, then part of your duties was actually to, to draw an academy for the students. Right? You'd be drawing in there with them, and you'd produce like a finished drawing, and, and a lot of what the students did was actually copy like originals, like original drawings, not like a, like a barred uh, plate or something like that. Oh, okay. So, so, that's, so that's one one example of something like that. And in fact, um, hmm. I think I actually have a painting of that. Now, later on, and I imagine that like Corrales Duran, for instance, Sergeant's teacher, I believe that he would, in fact, actually paint for his students, like uh, paint a head every now and then. But I don't think that it was uh, conceived of quite in the same way that, like, not the way that we do it now, I don't think. Hmm. Now, by the time you get to the later 19th century, see, like, this is, um, this is what people would do, like, in the 18th century. This is an original academy by this kid's teacher, and here he is copying it. With, huh. you know, it's great easel setup. Oh my god, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh you know, so, god. in any case, but by the time that you get to Jerome and Cabanel, there was this kind of, um, and I've heard it, I've read it, uh, I can't call to mind exactly where, but that there wasn't, that they didn't teach technique, that they weren't interested in teaching technique, it wasn't really part of, now, I think part of it, it's important to understand what they mean by technique. Like, to them, I think, at least the sense that I get from the stuff that I've read, is that technique is handcraft. Technique is material knowledge. Technique is like how to hold a pencil, how to use a charcoal, how to, you know, how to apply the paint. Bona and Cabanel had, uh, and Jerome had very little interest in discussing that. Their interest was primarily in things that were not considered technique, but are the sort of aesthetic and the uh, intellectual aspects of formulating a figure. So for instance, the construction, the gesture, the movement. So Jerome's critiques primarily hinge on principles rather than on actual material that. processes. No, sorry, it comes the uh... <laughs> No, I, that's so that's that's so good to hear. Um Ramon, I think that's really interesting because I just highly doubt like if, if a student was having measuring problems on their figure that Jerome would sit down in their little box, their little like, you know, uh, stool and try to measure for the student to correct their drawings, right? It's just absolutely absurd. They wouldn't do that, right? Yeah, absolutely not. Like, uh, what I think... So I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> you guys are like, no more measuring. I'm not, if, if there's a problem, you're... <laughs> I'm just, I'm just waiting to hear that somebody uses that like that just sick critique of like oh you know the error the error is radical I advise you to turn to flip this over and start again um, but you now there are various reports of like particularly Bona like if you need if you read uh, Thomas Aikens' letters back home he talks about how if you ask Bona like how to do something like a material process he would just say do it however you want. And, or he would call over another student and be like, hey, here, show them how to do that. So right. part of the idea was that the students were learning material stuff from each other. And the instructor who was only there twice a week, you know, in the beginning to see how you started and in the end to see how your work ended up. The teacher was there to teach, as I said, like larger principles. And there's a record of Jerome telling a student that his figure is disjointed. And so he tells him to go look at Raphael's drawings. He says, look at how each bone hangs onto the other one by a string. And see how he never, ever breaks a line. What he's referring to is basically the idea of like continuity and rhythm and gesture, basically. And he tells him, too, like, Raphael does it with much less work than you do. But look at like the you know, perfect flow of this, uh, of this thing. And so I think the critiques were mainly limited to stuff like that, like in 
Lord's, Lord's Tuxin's letters back home, uh, when he talks about the Atelier Bona, he, I think he's telling his sister about this, but he's saying that values, construction, movement, or maybe it was character, but values and construction for sure, like those are the things that someone like Bona was concerned with. He would tell his students, you know, when you look at the feet, or when you do the feet, look at the head, right? Because they weren't just top to bottom painting. And so part of the admonishment was that even though you're painting piece by piece, not to forget the ensemble. Like that was uh, paramount, I think, to, there isn't a whole lot of information about Cabanel's pedagogy, but I think, it, I'm sure it's in line with the rest of them, mm -hmm. that I think that's primarily what that consisted of. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Any questions, you guys? Not all at once. So. <laughs> <laughs> It was so thorough, Ramon. That might have been our only question. Oh, okay. All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> We're all blown away here. You know what? If, if we have a little bit, bit of extra time, then um, I had I had a couple of like extra things that I think are just kind of fun to look at. Okay. Uh, so they actually dispatched uh, John Sparks out to um, out to Germany a, a second time. Right, so he didn't just go once. Um, and so, let's see. So this is the second Sparks report from 1877, so it's from the, the following year. Um, and he talks about a bunch of like industrial art schools and stuff, but let me see if we can get to the good stuff. Okay, so, let's see, so report of the headmaster of the National Art Trading School, South Kensington, on his visit to the German and other schools of art, blah, 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 blah. So here he talks about the Royal Academy of Fine Art under the directorship of um, Anton von Werner. So basically the academy in Germany had been um, reconstituted like a couple of years prior. And, you know, he goes into talking about the curriculum and how that was all set up. Now let me see if I can pull up one of the, um, one of the paintings here. Uh, let's see. The profile. Okay, so when he talks about Anton von Werner, this is the person that he, the, the person who painted this. This is who he's talking about. Yeah, Can everybody see that? Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah so this is this is supposed to be uh, this is these are troops in their quarters, and after basically the Prussians took Paris in 1871. I mean, they just like completely eradicated Paris. <laughs> Uh, at one point, but in any case, this is um, so. This is the person who's in charge of your academy. If you're in Berlin, I mean, you know, I would. If he told me that my drawing and painting would get better if I jumped off a bridge, I mean, I'd I'd be there. Like, okay, sure, <laughs> that sounds right. Um, I was showing my students this yesterday. They're like, look at that. Like, it's just like, I mean, how much better can can one get? God, how do you do that? <clears throat> So he painted this, uh, he was director of the academy at 30, which is pretty impressive. Uh, he painted this when he was, um, I think like 50 or something like that. So this is, this is sometime after. But in any case, let's go back to um, what, uh, what Sparks has to say about it. So let's see, so they didn't do any copies of the flat, but they kept engravings and lithographs and photographs around just for, um, of different kinds actually. Just for, you know, for inspiration for the students and just stuff to look at. Um, let's see. So, also in the antique room, excellent drawings done by artists of renown are hung up to stimulate the students. Examples of every sort of manipulation are brought in before their observation, and their critical power is stimulated into activity by these opportunities of comparing different styles and systems of work. So it looks like they had a variety of different kinds of, um, of approaches uh, represented. So, blah, blah, blah. Students, while still in the antique or elementary section, frequently draw the head from the living model as an encouragement to themselves and a test of their teacher's guidance. Okay, now we get to the good part. In the painting school, the model is placed for 32 hours and all studies are made the size of life. Which, wow, that's that great. is insane. Like, that's... And uh, it is the draped model is sometimes arranged is sometimes so arranged with background accessories so as to be completely made up as for a picture. This is then treated as a picture and is worked out 
with that end in view rather than with regard to the literal facts of the model. At other times, the half-length nude figures painted the size of life. The method of painting followed by the students under Mr. Gousseau is peculiar. The local color of the model is sought out and put down exactly without any intermixture of the tints, even at their edges, being permitted. Uh, being permitted. Of course, no glazing is allowed. In fact, the tints, whether of light, halftone, or shadow, are carefully thought out and then rendered by the simplest pigments and put down on the canvas in the simplest way. Nothing can exceed the brilliancy and truthfulness of the results, but they must be viewed at a distance sufficient to allow the mosaic-like texture to disappear. It is a very valuable method, as it ensures thoughtful work on the part of the painter and encourages deliberate manipulation in the place of clever painting, which too often is attained by the sacrifice of truth. Now, this is also a persistent theme, uh, this condemnation of cleverness, you know, of any kind of just purely um, sort of meretricious facility in, in painting. You know, basically, no teachers wanted to see anybody showing off. They wanted you to do the best possible job to match things as closely as you could without any kind of like flashy brush strokes or that kind of thing. Now, Gousseau, the, the teacher, the figure painting teacher that's mentioned here, painted one of just the best kittens I've ever seen painted. Oh my god! So flat. Apparently, it's really hard to paint cats because I can't tell you how many shitty cats I've seen painted at the Getty and other places. But this one's just a knockout. Oh my god, that is so, so cute. So this is the person who was teaching figure painting, who was teaching that mosaic-like method. Now, obviously that has similarities to the way that Corrales Duran, Sargent's teacher, is said to have painted, but, you know, Gasol was better at drawing than Corrales Duran, and so you get slightly different results. Like, that's, you know, I mean, that's only in the application that, uh, that the similarities are. But you notice, like, a certain kind of brushing across um, in, these, um, in these paintings. So that's one painting by Gasol. I mean, what a team, right? You have Anton von Werner as the director, and you have uh, Gasol as the, uh, you know, out there in the trenches as the painting, uh, figure painting teacher. Here's another one of his paintings. He became, uh, after his tenure at the Academy, I believe he became like a, a fashionable portrait painter in, uh, in Berlin. So this is like a whole other area that, like, I don't know very much about the German schools. I've been digging, but there's, you know, it's harder to find, like, you know, I don't read any German, so it's, uh, you know, I just have to rely on Google Translate for the, uh, for the stuff that I can't find in English. Now, one, uh, one little note, by the way, is if, if any one of you is interested in, uh, in learning more about the Ecole and, you know, some of the information on, like, the times for figure paintings and, and, and the like in the contest system, you can pick up this book called The Grand Prix de Rome uh, from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. It's written by uh, Philippe Grunchet. This thing's like $5. You, you can buy it really right now for $5. Yeah. Now, I would hurry because they only have, oh, you have one, two, two copies for $5, one for six. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts going up from there. So, you know, I would uh, just pretend it's Black Friday and just uh, <laughs> kick elbow and toss your, your uh, fellow students aside to get a copy of this. It's a great book. And if you can't get that one, then you can get Gods and Heroes, which is a more recent one. This is by Eminol Shorts, who's the curator at the, at the Ecole, and a very, very nice man. And um, this one's $9. Whoa. And this one comes with that big, big image of that uh, Sergeant Cass drawing that everybody likes. Oh, wow. Cool. And it comes with, like, a couple of other drawings. It also comes with these, like, kind of silly-looking 18th century uh, torso paintings, and then some close-ups of that really good uh, Bouguereau from, uh, from 1850. So, I, I mean, again, I would pick these up just because they're so cheap. Like, I've bought several copies, I think, of each of these books just because why not? Um, but in any case, um, speaking of the German schools, I'll just show you real quick. This is, uh, these are some of the examples that I've been gathering about uh, from the uh, Munich Academy. And again, I plan on writing a bunch of essays and stuff like that on my website as time goes on. Uh, once I'm done with the, with the video project that I'm working on right now, then I want to start uh, writing a little bit more. I wish this were in higher resolution. This is a painting by one of the teachers. This is by uh, Wilhelm von Diaz. This is by Anton Ashba, who was one of the students and subsequently became a teacher and very influential for Russian art education, actually. 
This is another by Anton Ashba. This is from uh, Gabriel von Hockel's class when he was 24. This drawing is two, basically 200 centimeters by 100 centimeters, which is about seven feet by three feet. <laughs> the Munich Academy, well, the German academies are almost the only ones that I know of that work life size. Wow. The Munich Academy, from what I understand, is one of the only ones that had poses that lasted months and months, but the drawings are like 50 inches across. So, I mean, they did do very long poses, kind of like contemporary ateliers, but also, like, I mean, they have some very um, clear and consistent differences. So, here more by Anton with Ashba. Painting by him. This is uh, Karl Oranther. He's a favorite of mine, Celestin Medovich. Again, wish I had a higher resolution version of this. This is by Frank Duvenek. Uh, very sort of clear example of the sort of Munich style. Not great in terms of construction. You know, I, I came to find out um, a couple months ago, reading this book in, uh, at LACMA, that Frank Duvenet, for some reason, was allowed to skip life drawing. Like, they basically, because the, the Munich system, you basically would go into, you would choose your teacher, right? And, and I think a lot of your education I mean, once you did like the elementary like cast drawing and figure drawing, you could go into like a teacher's painting workshop and your education was at their discretion. Well, Frank, Frank Duvenek basically wowed people so much, even though he hadn't had a lot of education before, he wowed them so much with like his heads and stuff like that and I guess some of the antique figures that they skipped life drawing, they just hopped them over to the painting class, which I think was actually a huge miscalculation because, you know, there's a, there's a multi-figure painting by Frank Duvenek. At, uh, at the National Gallery in DC, I'm just going to say you can tell they didn't have life drawing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really can. And what's interesting is that Toby Rosenthal, another American, uh, an American from San Francisco, actually wrote his teacher, or ran, I, know, I think he ran into him, uh, Carl von Pilati, who was in charge of, uh, of the Munich Academy, and he told him, like, look, our drawing education kind of sucks. We should do something about that. So Pilati got mad. And then he reconsidered, and then he tenured all of the drawing uh, staff and hired new teachers from his own students. And lo and behold, the drawing standard of Munich went way, way, way up. I mean, just like way up. So in the 1880s, after uh, Frank Duvenek and William Mary Chase left, the standard of drawing is just like tremendous. I mean, absolutely tremendous. So here we'll just look at a couple more. Uh, this is like clearly a, a stump drawing. This is by... Uh, Georgios Jakobaitis, who was a Greek painter. There's a whole contingent of Greek painters that went to, um, but basically anybody from like Eastern Europe would just end up going to the Academy in Munich. This is a favorite of mine that I want to go visit at some point. It's in uh, the museum in Revoltella in Italy. Yeah. Didn't Chase study at Yeah, where did Chase study? Chase was there in the 1870s. So Chase studied at the Royal Academy in Munich, and he ended up in the workshop of Karl von Pilati. Didn't he study in Dusseldorf? I don't think so. Dusseldorf wasn't really a big deal anymore by that time, as far as I understand. The Hudson River painters, some of them went to study in Dusseldorf, but by Chase's time, I think that the, that school had lost its prominence. Um, although it was very influential on, on American painting for a long time. Like the guy that painted the uh, painting of um, Washington crossing the Delaware, I think he was uh, he was trained in Dusseldorf. But by this, by the 1870s, basically Paris and uh, Munich were, you know, the main places that Americans were going, and obviously for people from Britain, Antwerp was another option. So here, here are like some sketchbook studies by John Otis Adams, who was an American. Uh, a bunch of people from Indiana went to study out in Munich. And funny enough, um, the Mormon Church sent a bunch of people to study in uh, in Paris at the Academie Julian uh, a little bit afterwards. Uh, just to decorate, I think, like one of their uh, one of their temples. So these are examples of just the kind of paintings that were done in Munich. Again, not so many, no, not any real like nude paintings, but mostly like torsos and stuff like that. A lot of heads, a lot of study heads. 
This is by Samuel Richards, who's also an American. The drawing is 65 by 34 inches. What? Oh my God. That's huge. <laughs> it's enormous, right? It's like actually life size. Here's another one by Samuel Richards. Wow. So these things apparently took months and months. Um, this is by Carl Stoffer Byrne. How long would they spend uh, with the painting? I haven't seen anything documented about that. Uh, I haven't been able to find anything, although I do believe that in, in, this is probably from Loft's class. So Ludwig von Loft had the reputation of just working on his own paintings for months and months, and I believe that he might have done the same with his students. Mm. Here's a crucifixion. There's, uh, here's another one by uh, Theodore Clement Steele. You know, what's interesting about these uh, these artists is that they actually, they're mostly from Indiana. They went back to Indiana and didn't quite meet the success, I think, that they were hoping for in terms of their figurative work. So a lot of them became landscape painters and never really made anything quite like this again. Yeah. No market for it. Yeah, no market for it. Yeah. And, and they paint the figure really well, I mean. Wow, that's beautiful. As that's is pretty beautiful. obvious from, uh, from that. Let me see. And this is actually by one of the teachers, by uh, Wilhelm von Lindenschmidt. Wow. Again, like very vigorous paint application. This is what Munich was known for. It's this period. The um, uh, this has always been a favorite of mine. Oh wow! I mean, just you know, this is after the reforms. I mean, just wow. fantastic wow. drawing. And I mean, honestly, not surprising because. The person that they put at the helm of the uh, one of the drawing classes was um, I know I'm going to butcher this because I don't speak Hungarian, but Jula Benzur. Oh right, this yeah, he did that. Yes, yeah, so baptism. It's, painting. Yeah, the guy who painted this is the guy who was at the helm for the uh, life drawing class. Amazing. And obviously, he was phenomenal. Now, one little note about the uh, Munich Academy, if um, any of you happens to um, uh, uh, Wisconsin anytime soon, if you go to uh, Milwaukee, you can see um, this painting. Let's see if I can find a, a larger version of that. I think von Marr was born in Germany, then he lived in Milwaukee, like grew up there, went back to Germany to study, and came back to Milwaukee, realized there wasn't really a market for what he was doing, and so he went back to Germany, and then just became, lived the rest of his days there, became a professor, and, but now the Museum of Milwaukee, or the Wisconsin, uh, Museum of Wisconsin Art, owns a lot of his work, oh, wow. including this, this like March of the Flagellants. Which, you know, like after he painted this, he painted this while still a student, like based almost like a, you know, almost like a kind of like postgraduate kind of work. If you can imagine a painting being like a dissertation. And he was offered positions like at a bunch of academies afterwards. And people were just kind of like, hey, you want to come teach here? You, like, you want to run this place for us? And he eventually accepted one and, you know, lived out the rest of his life up there. So in any case, um, you know, as I said maybe um, I don't know. Maybe some other time we can get into some of the uh, some of the painting examples and that kind of thing. Sounds good. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Woo! Well, I guess we'll we'll close. So thank you so much, Ramon. Thank you. Are, you, are your cat still on the bed? <laughs> Uh, yeah, they haven't moved. No way! Are you serious? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> that means, I mean, they actually have. Oh, they they literally have moved, but not like not too far. They, I think they switched. That's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the uh, that's the extent of um, of what they've been here. Let me go ahead and stop uh, sharing the screen. Okay. <laughs> oh great. <laughs> But, well, we really appreciate your time and all the oh. information you put together. So thank you again. Yeah, of course. And yeah, I'll try to like put like a list together or something. And I'll mail. I'll yeah. send it to you. Or I'll send email it to, Eric. it to me, and then I can email it out or email it to Eric. And um, okay. Yeah, and we'll be in touch with other little things as well.
Okay, perfect. Well, thank you all so much. I mean, I, I had a great time, and I hope you did too. Okay, we did. Thank you so much. Woo! Thank you.